Well, have you ever wondered what a proper thank you note looked like? I remember uh, when I was growing up, my mother, she bore seven of us, and she made sure every time we received something from someone, we sat down and wrote a thank you note. She never told me how to do it. She just said, you need to sit down and thank the person that gave you this gift. And I remember it made such an impression on me that when I had my two children, I did the same. You're going to sit down and write a thank you note to your parents or grandparents or whoever it is that gave you this gift. And I hope that they are instilling that in their grandchildren as, or my grandchildren as well. But have you ever wondered what a proper thank you note looks like? Well, the people in the know, they tell us there are seven steps to a good thank you note. So ladies, if you don't know what they are, here they are. Number one, you need to begin with a fresh sheet of note paper and a smooth pen. Thank you notes are traditionally written in cursive. Who writes in cursive anymore? And are headed by the date and salutation. Dear Aunt Ruth, followed by a comma. Step number two, thank the recipient for the gift, the favor, or the entertainment that was given. Step number three, write about the appropriateness of the gift or the favor. For example, your babysitting for my children has truly been a lifesaver in these difficult times. Step number four, tie the appropriateness of the gift to the person who gave it to you. For example, you've always understood my taste in clothes. Step number five, write about how you plan to use the gift. For example, I have a picture of my parents that will look perfect in your frame. If you've received a gift of money, mention how you're going to use it. Step number six, add a line to update the giver about your life. I've completely recovered from my cold, and I plan to hit the slopes again as soon as I can. And then step number seven, sign your thank you note. With thanks, Billy. Now, there you go, ladies, how to write a perfect thank you note. Now, you might say, well, what in the world does this have to do with our lesson? Well, as we come to our second to the last lesson in Philippians, the Apostle Paul gives us not seven steps to how to write a thank you note, but three steps in writing a thank you note. So let's see what those steps are. Let's read verses 14 through 19. Nevertheless, Paul writes, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again for my necessity. Not that I'm seeking a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we consider the three steps of uh, Paul's thank you note. Step number one. Paul is going to give thanks to the church for the gift in verses 14 to 17. Step number two, Paul is going to thank the one who delivered the gift in verse 18. And then lastly, step number three, Paul is going to give thanks to the great gift giver of all in verse 19. So three steps, and I'll go over those as we uh, go through the lesson this morning. As we uh, ended last week, we saw that Paul had four keys to contentment. We learned that Paul did not learn contentment by osmosis, but he had to learn it through the hardships of life. But we saw four keys to contentment, and I hope that you have uh, thought about those, and I hope you've implemented them in your life this week, whatever the Lord has brought in your life, that you've thought about these four keys. Number one, we saw that uh, the key to contentment is entrust your needs to God, whatever they might be, financial, physical emotional. We are to entrust those needs to God. The second key to contentment, remember, is to learn contentment by the hardships of life. And Paul says, I've learned to be content by all the difficulties that the Lord has brought me through. I've learned contentment. And we looked at some of those hardships that Paul went through in uh, Corinthians together last week. The third key to contentment, if you'll recall, is live independent of your circumstances. Paul did. It didn't matter if he was hungry, if he was full, if he had good relationships, if he had bad relationships. It didn't matter. 
He learned to be content. So we talked about living independent of our circumstances. And then the last key to contentment that we saw last week is draw upon your resources in Christ Jesus. And we saw where Paul did. We, we draw upon the word, the prayer, the Holy Spirit, one another. And so we draw upon what God has given to us as we go through things in life that can cause us to be discontent. And so he ended last week, if you'll notice, he ended up talking about the resources that we have in Christ Jesus and that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And so speaking of the resources that we talked about last week, Paul moves on to write a word of thanks for the provisions that have been made on his behalf by the church at Philippi. 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 I don't know where that came from because I'm talking about Paul at Philippi. Uh, to say that seven times. Anyway, Paul comes to the end of his letter here, and he wants to express his thanks to them in three different ways. And so the first step is thanks to the church for the gift that they gave him. So he starts in verse 14 by saying this, notwithstanding, not that, notwithstanding, excuse me, uh, I have to get find my notes here, Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did share with my afflictions. Now, the word notwithstanding means moreover or besides, and it's a word that connects the previous verses. So listen very carefully. Paul is saying, that is, even though I know how to have nothing, even though I know how to have everything, even though I know how to be through, go through everything in life, even though I've learned contentment, and I am content. Remember he said he'd learned the secret. He learned the mystery contentment. Even though that's true about me, Paul says, I still have a thankful heart. I have a grateful heart. Ladies, just because the Apostle Paul was content did not mean he was unthankful. In fact, I would encourage you, if you've never read The Art of Divine Contentment by Thomas Watson, I would encourage you to do that. And one of the things that he reiterates over and over and over in that small book he wrote over centuries ago, he says, a thankful spirit is a contented spirit. A discontented spirit is a discontented person. If you've ever been around someone who's discontent, they're unthankful. If you've ever been around someone who's contented, they're thankful. And uh, yesterday I got to spend some time with Carolyn, and she, to me, is one of the key uh, classic examples of someone who's not only thankful but very, very content. And so Paul's saying just because I'm content doesn't mean I'm unthankful. I'm very thankful. In fact, one man puts it like this. Paul says this, Do not think that because I'm thus independent of earthly contingencies that I lightly prize your gift, end of quote. And ladies, there's certainly a principle for you and me in what Paul says here. We should be thankful. We should be gracious for those who give things to us, even if we've learned to be content without those things, even if we don't think we need those things. I remember when I got married, um, somebody sent me a very unusual wedding gift. They sent me butter in a butter dish and uh, sugar packets that they had collected from restaurants that had tea stains on them. Now, ladies, these things traveled over 1,500 miles, and so you can matter what butter in the butter dish looked like by the time it came from California to Oklahoma. And uh, nonetheless, even though it was a very strange thank you gift, or thank you, uh, or wedding gift, I still wrote a thank you note. And so even though you might not think you need or desire those things, you can still be thankful. And so Paul was not saying thank you for your gift. It really wasn't necessary, as evidenced by the words he says next. You have done well. You have done well. In fact, these words done well are in the aorist tense in the Greek, which would point to a particular act. And so Paul is referring specifically here to the gift that Epaphroditus brought. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. He says, you've done well. You have done well in bringing me this gift. You are complimented for your generosity. In fact, it's very similar to the Greek word that Jesus uses in Mark 14, 6. Remember when the woman poured a bottle of oil, of ointment on his feet, and there were some that were complaining, and, she, and they said, why is this woman doing this? this? This oil could have been sold for 300 denarii. Why is she wasting this oil on your feet? And remember what Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? He says, what she has done is what? 
She has done well. She has done what? Good work for me. What she is doing is good. Paul is saying the same thing to the church at Philippi. You have done well. You have done well in giving me this gift. And so this is not just an acknowledgement that they had done their duty, but this was a positive and a generous praise, a beautiful deed. You have done well by helping me out. You have done well, notice what he says, by sharing in my distress. What does this mean? Well, the word shared means to communicate, communicate or participate in something with someone. What's Paul saying? You have shared with me in my distress, in my affliction. In fact, the word here, uh, affliction or distress, means to squish, uh, to squeeze, to press. It's, it's a hard affliction, and we know, we've, we've talked about this through our study in Philippians, the type of prison that Paul was in, the difficulty that he had, was having. And yet he says, by this gift that you've given to me, you've done well in giving this gift to me, You've shared in my affliction, my distress, the difficulty that I am going through here in prison. Ladies, many times this is true in our own life, right? We don't necessarily need monetary gifts. You know, we don't need money necessarily, but we need things that are far more precious, those who will share in our hurts, right, in our joys. Many times as you go through an affliction, doesn't, you don't necessarily need money. Maybe you need a note from someone. Maybe you need a hug from someone. I think uh, since my husband's passed away, I'll take all the hugs I can get, you know, and so that's a way that somebody can share with me in my distress. I don't necessarily need money, but a note or a hug or a text saying, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, uh, some, being invited to someone's house for dinner, that's not a hint to invite me over. But uh, that's a way you can share in people's afflictions as they're going through difficulties. And that's what Paul was saying. You shared with me in my distress, even though we're not together, I'm in prison, you're in Philippi, you've done well in that you sent the gift, and so you're sharing with me in my affliction. Well, Paul goes on to mention in his thanks to the church at Philippi that they were the only ones who gave to his need. Notice what he says in verse 15. You Philippians know, in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. What's Paul referring to here? Well, I know it's going to take some dusting the cobwebs off your brain right now. But remember in our introductory lesson that the first mentioning of Paul preaching the gospel at Philippi was found in Acts 16. Remember that's where uh, the Lord opened Lydia's heart and she became the first convert in Philippians. And also then right after that, the Philippian jailer. But remember, Paul did not stay there. He did not remain there as seen in Acts 17. And that's what he's referring to here. He says, when I departed from Macedonia. And what happened at Macedonia? Notice what Paul says, no church shared with me there. No church gave to me. No church in Macedonia helped with me. Nobody helped me there. But only what? But only you. No one helped me out. No one distributed anything to me. No one imparted anything to me. But he says you guys did. Now, ladies, Paul is referring here to a principle in Scripture that I think most of you know by now, that those who labor in the gospel, and certainly Paul did, they're to be financially provided for. And yet, the church at Macedonia did not help him. Shame on them. I don't know much about them, but shame on them, right? But the church at Philippi took up the slack when the church at Macedonia did not help them. And yet we know that the Bible is very clear that those who labor in the word and doctrine are to be worthy of double honor. And those that share in the word with you, you are supposed to share it back with them. In fact, if we receive spiritual food from others, it is a principle that we should give materially to support them. And Paul says, no church there shared with me, but you only. They were alone in this. The church at the Philippi was the only one who was supporting Paul. And ladies, I think here we see a human side of Paul. Um, he recognized that even though others failed him, other churches failed in helping him, 
The church at Philippi did not. They helped him out. In fact, Paul mentions this same fact to the church at Corinth uh, regarding the help from Philippi. If you want to turn there, you can, but if you want to, you can just listen. 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9, he mentions this same truth. He says, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. Who's the other churches? I robbed the church at Philippi. <laughs> you know, he's not taking and stole money, but he said, they helped me out. He said, taking wages from them to minister to you. Who? The church at Corinth. And when I was present with you in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and everything I've kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will I keep myself. The reference to Macedonia is a reference to the Philippian believers. They helped him out even when Paul was at Corinth. <laughs> so, I mean, they were falling. These other churches were failing. But the church at Philippi was known as a giving church. And ladies, this perhaps explains why the Apostle Paul felt all alone in the ministry, because very few churches were willing to help him, and yet he was going from town to town, starting all these churches and laboring to the point of exhaustion uh, to set up all these churches on all of his missionary journeys. And yet few were helping him out. And he had needs just like you and I do. He had need for food and clothing and shelter. And yet we see the church at Philippi. No wonder they were so close to Paul. No wonder he loved them so dearly is because they ministered to him and gave him uh, his for his needs when he had needs needs. And so it's not a wonder he had a special place in their heart and he in their heart. Well, Paul goes on to elaborate, elaborate about their sacrificial giving in verse 16. He says, even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So not only did the Philippian believers contribute to Paul's needs after he departed from Macedonia, but also when he went to Thessalonica. Lady, what a, what a sad commentary on the churches. What a sad commentary on the other churches but what a wonderful commentary on the church at philippi now what's he talking about here well we know thessalonica is a place in asia minor it was a macedonian city near philippi uh, where a church was founded by paul before his departure into achaia and if you would uh, turn back to acts chapter 17 because i want you to see this here um, i think it's important for us to look at this acts chapter 17 i want to read quite a few verses out of here Acts 7, 17, so we can get a little bit of a flavor as to what he's talking about. Starting in verse 1, it says this. Now, when they had passed through Amphibolus and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well, and men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So in Acts 16, what? The church at Philippi had been established. Now in 17, Paul is in Thessalonica, and he wasn't readily received. I mean, they threw him out of town. And evidently, that's what he's talking about here in Philippians. This is when the church at Philippi 
came in once again and provided for Paul's needs. And ladies, I think we have to say, uh, not only is this amazing, a commentary on the church at Philippi, and it's amazing for many reasons, but they were a brand new church. They had just been established in Acts 16, and now here in Acts 17, just a little bit later, what are they doing? <laughs> They're helping Paul out again. And again, what a sad commentary on the rest of the churches. I know in the three churches that my husband planted um, in the 40, well, the 50 years God gave him to minister, um, it was a blessing to see how all three of the churches were giving churches. And uh, that was encouragement to both my husband and I, not just giving uh, to the church, but to missionaries and to those in need and helping one another and giving to one another. And ladies, that's what I pray and I hope that this church always remains a church that's known not by just giving financially, but loving one another and pouring out our lives for the sake of one another. And so the church at Philippi was uh, certainly had a great testimony. And what a blessing for Paul that uh, even though Thessalonica met, uh, let him down and some of these other churches let him down, the church at Philippi was faithful. And it wasn't a one-time gift. Notice what he says here. You sent aid once and again. Again and again and again, you help me out. They were faithful givers. What a contrast to the rest of the churches. Well, even though Paul has thanked them for their giving, he wants them to know there's something far more important. Look at verse 17. He says, not that I'm seeking a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What's Paul saying? Remember what he, also, what he said last time we were together? Even though I don't have very much, I... I really, it's okay. I don't really have any needs. And that's what he's saying here. I'm not seeking the gift. I'm not demanding a gift. Did I, you know, say, hey, bring me some money, Epaphroditus? Hey, give to me. Am I like those televangelists that bang on the pulpit and demand God to give? He said, no, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. Remember, I've learned to be content. Whether I'm hungry, famished, or whether I'm full, whether I have everything or whether I have nothing, I'm content. And Paul says, it's not that I'm seeking the gift. I'm not desirous of the money, but what is he desirous of? He says, I want you to be obedient. I want you to be obedient. This is part of the responsibility of the church. I want you to give from a cheerful heart. Paul says, I'm not seeking a gift, but I'm seeking fruit. Fruit from what? From you all. <laughs> I want you to be obedient. Ladies, do you know your giving is a part of your sanctification? It's a part of the fruit. It's a part of what God wants you to do. Ladies, they need to learn, like we all do, that giving is an act of obedience. You know, giving is an act of worship. When you put that tithe uh, in the offering box back there or you get on tithely, do you know you're worshiping the Lord? That is an act of worship. And Paul says that fruit, what, abounds to their account. In fact, the word account is a phrase which is taken from commercial dealings. What's Paul saying? I don't have a need, but I do have a need that you all would be fruitful. Why? Because that'll abound to your account, to your credit. When you stand before the Lord and he says, hey, what'd you do with your money? <laughs> you know, the church at what, this and I can say, well, we kept it. I don't know what they did with it, but we didn't help out Paul. But the church at Philippi can say, you know what? We gave sacrificially. We helped our brother Paul out. And Paul says, I want the gift added to your spiritual count. I want you to spiritually grow in this area. And I will tell you, ladies, in the many years that my husband and I uh, shepherded together flocks, do you know almost verbatim, every couple that we tried to help in that was in a financial mess, one of the questions we'd ask was, do you give to the church? No. Well, if you would start being faithful to the Lord, you can't outgive God. If you'll start giving to the Lord, we can almost guarantee your financial problems will go away. That is, if you're being good stewards of your money. But you can't outgive God. And that's what Paul's saying. This is part of your responsibility is to help those in the ministry and those in need. And so Paul says, I don't want the gift. I want the fruit for you. What a, what a generous man. He's not concerned about himself. He's still concerned about them. As we've seen throughout the whole epistle of Philippians, it's all about them, not about him. Well, after he finishes step one in thanking the church at Philippi, he begins step two in this thank you note. He, th he gives thanks for the one who delivered the gift. Look at verse 18. 
Indeed, I have all, and I abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Paul says, indeed, I have all, and abound. In fact, the words I have mean to receive or obtain from another. And the word all indicates the totality. What's he saying? I'm completely satisfied. I'm entirely satisfied. And he's not only satisfied, but he uses the word abound, which means I'm super abounding. I'm in excess. I have so much, I'm full. I'm overflowing. I lack nothing. I've been paid in full. Now, how did Paul get this gift from the church at Philippi? Well, notice what he says. Who was responsible? Paul says, I have received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. We've talked many times throughout the study in our uh, in Philippians how Epaphroditus was more than likely the pastor of the church at Philippi. And remember, he says in chapter 2, nobody would do it, nobody would come, uh, no one was like-minded. But Epaphroditus walked 800 miles from Philippi to Rome to bring Paul this gift. And so he says, who gave it? Epaphroditus. I am full having received the things from Epaphroditus. In fact, the word receive means to accept an offer deliberately and readily. And we saw when we were back in Philippians chapter 2 that Epaphroditus almost lost his life doing this. And again, what an example. Not only Paul was an example who emptied his life for the sake of others, but so did Epaphroditus. And he was so sick it almost called him, uh, cost his life. And Paul says, but God had mercy on him, and not on Epaphroditus only, but on me too. <laughs> At least I should have sorrow upon sorrow, the sorrow that I'm in prison, but also the sorrow that I would lose my dear brother Epaphroditus. But God had mercy on him. Now you might be wondering, well, what are the things that he received? Well, more than likely when it says that he was full having received all the things from Epaphroditus, the gift would have included several things, probably money for sure. Remember, uh, prison food was rarely available, water, uh, just things that he would need. Also, it might include uh, some clothes. It could be, you know, remember in Timothy, he um, asked for uh, someone to bring him a coat because he was cold there in prison. And so it could be that Epaphroditus uh, brought him some clothes. His uh, clothes might have been wearing out. And even maybe some scriptures. Uh, remember in 2 Timothy, Paul asked for not only uh, the coat, but he says uh, especially the parchments, the scriptures. And so uh, more than likely, Paul would not have much of the holy scriptures with him, if any. And so it could be that Epaphroditus brought him some, uh, some of the scrolls, some of the sacred scriptures. So we don't know for sure, but we do know more than likely it was money, perhaps clothes, and uh, perhaps some scriptures. So we don't know for sure, but we do know, notice how Paul describes this gift in three ways, beautiful. He says the first description of this gift, it's a sweet smelling aroma. This means it was symbolically a fragrance and it's in reference to the pleasant fragrance produced in the temple uh, by the burning of the incense. Remember back in Exodus 29, 18, uh, it gives us a glimpse of this and it says, and you will burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Ladies, this would be an indication that the gift that Paul got was an odor, an aroma of delight. And he's not saying it's a literal aroma like a candle or, or your essential oils or anything like that. He's just saying it was pleasant. It was pleasant. And ladies, I'm sure we can all identify with that. Have you ever received a gift and it's just a sweet blessing? Just a sweet blessing from someone. It might be a book. It might be a scarf they made for you. It might be a piece of jewelry. And it doesn't necessarily smell good, but what? It's like a sweet aroma. It's a blessing. They've thought about you. They've remembered you. And here in this specific uh, instance, it was the church at Philippi remembering that Paul was in prison. And so he said, it's like a sweet aroma to my heart. 
The second quality of this gift he received, notice what he says, it's an acceptable sacrifice. This is a sacrifice that was indicative of somewhat which was an object of divine approval. That's what he's saying. It's an acceptable sacrifice. God approves this. It's like what Paul refers to in uh, Romans 12 when he talks about devoting ourselves to God as a sacrifice. Remember when he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God. And Paul says, this is a sacrifice. I know this was a sacrifice for you all, but you know what? It's a divine sacrifice. It's approved by God. And then he has a third and final description of this precious gift from Epaphroditus. Notice what he says. He says, it's well-pleasing to God. It's well-pleasing. Hey, church at Philippi, God knows you gave this gift. He recognized it. It's his will and you're pleasing him. It's pleasing to God. Ladies, God is pleased with that kind of giving that is sacrificial and faithful. In fact, Hebrews 13, 16 says, do not forget to do good and to share, for with what? Such sacrifices God is well pleased. Ladies, God is pleased when we give to help another. Well, after Paul gives thanks for the one who delivered the gift, Epaphroditus, as well as describing the type of gift it was, he moves lastly to step three in his thanks, and that is to the great gift giver of all. Notice what he says, and my God, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now you might be saying, why is Paul saying this right now? Why is he saying this statement at this point? Why does Paul shift from talking about his needs, which were met, to now talking about the fact that God would supply their needs? Think about it. They're sacrificial. They help Paul out when all the other churches wouldn't help him out. So what what might they be fearing? What might they be a little bit anxious about right now? Okay, we've sacrificed for you, Paul. We've given you all we have, and guess what? We might suffer. Uh, I've given you all I have. Remember the widow who gave all she had? Okay, I've given you everything I had, so what about me? And Paul says, my God, he will supply your needs. You're not going to suffer need. You know, sometimes when we give financially, we might not think we really have the money to give, right? And we might be tempted to wonder, should I make this decision? In fact, a few weeks ago, Uh, somebody I just really felt compelled to help and normally I don't do anything without asking Doug but he's not here and so I was like Lord what do you want me to do and uh, so I did and then you know I began to second guess myself did I do the right thing you know am I going to suffer need but you know you go back to this if God tells you to do it you do it right and I don't mean he's audibly speaking to you but if he lays on your heart to give you give it right and then Paul says so don't worry about it my God will supply your need, right? Ladies, a principle that gives weight to this truth is found in Luke 6, 38. Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will it be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be many measured back to you. Ladies, many times we don't give financially because we think it will strap us in some way or put us in some kind of a bind. But we cannot outgive God. Paul reminds the church, God will supply your need. Don't worry about this. Ladies, everything we have from God is from God anyway, right? I remember there were times when Doug would tell me, you know, we need to do this or we need to give this person. I go, how are we going to do that? We can't afford it. He goes, just do it. This is what the Lord wants us to do. And, you know, God was always faithful to us, always faithful. He never let us down. This is a promise. He will supply our needs. Ladies, don't ever doubt God. He will not fail you. As the psalmist puts it, the Lord is my shepherd. What? I will never want. I'll never want. How much will God supply? Does he promise to supply some of our needs? No. Notice what Paul says. He will supply all your needs. In fact, the word for need is necessity. I like what Warren Wearsby says. God has not promised to supply all our greeds. When the child of God is in the will of God, serving for the glory of God, he will meet every need. Hudson Taylor often said, when God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will not lack for God's supply, end of quote. Ladies, so many times 
we think we have needs when really they're just wants, right? Elizabeth Elliot used to say, if you needed it, you'd have it. <laughs> what are our needs? Food, shelter, clothing, right? Those are our needs. But we think our needs are what? Need a new iPhone, need a new car, need this. I need... No, you don't need that. You want that. But God is promised to supply our needs. In fact, I heard Elizabeth Elliot say one time, all you need is your Bible, a, bo a bowl, and a spoon. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. You know, I do need my Bible, and it would be good to have something to eat out of. But um, she certainly was a woman who lived out uh, these verses that Paul is saying here. Well, how does God supply our needs? Notice what Paul says. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The word for riches here means wealth, money, possession. Ladies, he owns everything. He owns those clothes you're wearing. He owns that chair you're sitting on. He owns the carpet that your feet are on right now. He owns, he owns this building. He owns this pulpit. He owns everything. And my God, what, will supply your need according to what? The riches, everything that he has is his anyway. Paul says, you've given to me from a willing heart, and you've given generously. Now God will supply your need as he always has, and he will continue to do. Ladies, God owns everything we have anyway, and he will repay the Philippians for their generosity out of the riches that he has in glory. What a great gift giver, right? The biggest gift giver of all. And what a great thank you note. So step number one in Paul's thank you note is thanks to the church for the gift. The church at Philippi gave to Paul again and again, even when other churches failed in their giving. Is your church a giving church? Are you a giver? Or are you a taker? Secondly, step number two, Paul's thanks for the one who delivered the gift was what? Epaphroditus nearly lost his life to bring this gift to Paul. Who have you blessed lately with a gift? How many thank you notes have you written lately? Did it cost you anything to give a gift? And step number three, Paul's thanks to the great gift giver of all. Paul recognizes the church gave financially, Epaphroditus gave his time and nearly his life, but the foundational resources of all we have comes from what? God. God will indeed supply our needs. Ladies, have you thanked God lately for all he's done for you? That's one thing I've started doing since Doug passed away. Started writing all the things every morning that God is doing for me. I want to be a thankful person, a contented person. Ladies, God has done much for us, and we need to thank him. The church at Philippi gave sacrificially along with Epaphroditus. What about you? Are you giving sacrificially? Did you know they say the average Christian gives only 2.5% of their adjusted gross income? We as 21st century Christians have veered far from the 23 and one-third percent of the Old Testament requirement. <laughs> it's a sad day in which we live that people would rather spend their money on pleasure than give to God's work. And yet, giving is a part of our worship and our obedience to God. Ladies, the Philippians were a good example for you and me to follow in the area of giving and giving again. So in closing, I want to give you eight principles for giving. These are not mine. They come out of a book, a guy that was on the staff at Master Seminary for a while, Dick Mayhew. He's really good on spiritual intimacy. But I want to give these to you by way of closing. Number one, he says, recognize that all we have is a gift from God. Everything you have is a gift from God. What does the psalmist say? If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness, right? Everything we have is from God. Number two, giving should be planned and regular as a part of your personal worship. Giving should be planned and regular as a part of your personal worship. You know, Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay aside something, storing up as you may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And so we're supposed to give regularly. Number three, give freely through a purposed heart. Give freely through a purposed heart. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, so let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. And number four, Giving involves a commitment to the Lord and trust in godly leaders. 
Ladies, you need to be careful who you give to. But giving involves a commitment to the Lord and trust in godly leaders. 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, And not only as we hope, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So you want to make sure who you give to. Uh, you know, I even got something yesterday from somebody. And, you know, my heart pulled a little bit. I go, no, I'm not going to give to that. So you want to be discerning in your giving. Number five, <clears throat> giving is not optional. Giving is not optional. In the same chapter, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is still speaking about giving in verse 12, and he says, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Number six, liberality best describes New Testament giving. Liberality best describes New Testament giving. 1 Corinthians 8, 2, talking about the churches at Macedonia, Paul says, In a great trial of affliction and abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. He's talking about the church at Philippi. The abundance in their deep poverty they gave. They gave. Number seven, did you know giving is going to be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ? Giving is going to be reviewed at the judgment seat of of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive for the things done in their body, whether it's good or bad. That means everything, right? We're going to give an account. And the last tip that he gives is this, number eight, giving will be a blessing to the giver. Giving will be a blessing to the giver. Acts 20.35 says this, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Ladies, if you're not in the habit of worshiping the Lord with your money, I want to encourage you to start today. Paul says it will abound. It will be credited to your spiritual account on Judgment Day. It's fruitful for you. It's profitable for God's kingdom. And don't fret about giving sacrificially. God has promised to supply all your need, even to the point of it running over. Finally, remember, give thanks not only for the provisions God has made for you financially, but give thanks for all the things and all the people in your life that the Lord has used to help you financially and spiritually on this journey we call life. Let's give thanks by way of closing. Oh, Father, thank you again for Paul. Thank you for his love for this church. Lord, just looking at this, these verses again, I'm so thankful for the church at Philippi, a brand-new baby church just barely starting out, and yet they got it. They got love and humility. They got that they were supposed to empty themselves for the sake of others, their time, their energy, their monies even. Lord, I thank you. I, I'm looking forward to meeting many of their members when we get to glory. And just, um, just their heart, Lord, of sacrificial, not just giving of monies, but themselves for the gospel. Thank you that they took the slack when the other churches uh, didn't do what they were supposed to do. And, Father, I pray that this church would always be one that is known to give sacrificially, not just in finances, Lord, but in time and energy and, and in love one to another. We pray that you will go with us as we go, and Lord, that you would guide us in all that we do and say for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.